it's a it's a pleasure to uh, introduce Francesco uh, Borsoi. Um, so when he started, uh, uh, as, as a postdoc in my group, um, we were actually talking about this, this topic. And then so uh, Francesco, he, he uh, did his master's in PISA. Then later on, he did his PhD in a group of Leo Kaunhoven, uh, really an expert on, on fabrication, focusing on hybrid systems. And, and you would think that, that someone with such knowledge on the fabrication, everything that goes wrong would kind of be shockingly running away if the project is to, to tune a 16 column of device. And yet he is so brave to, to, to take on this task. And, and, and today we'll present, you know, to what extent that there was a succession or, or, or not. So with that, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to give you the floor, uh, Francesco, uh, with the presentation, shared control of the 16 semiconductor one dot crossbar array. But thanks. Okay, thanks everybody. It's uh, first of all good to see you here in presence, and uh, yeah, um, nice to kick off this uh, meeting uh, in person. Um, audio is good, um, video seems good. So today I'm going to present our effort in realizing these um, shared control, like semiconductor function dot crossbar arrays, where a small number of control lines are used to, let's say, manipulate or operate a large number of quantum dots. And uh, I mean, I see the faces here. Many people know what a quantum dot is, but maybe just for the for the online audience, quantum dots are have been used a lot in, in quantum technology. There have been a broad uh, implementation of various type of quantum dots, and one of the one of the beauty is that they can be um, their spectrum is this, is discrete, and the spectrum can be engineered by choosing the correct by choosing the proper material, the proper size. And the proper dimensionality. And uh, we have seen in the last 20, 30 years a variety of implementations, starting from or such as um, quantum dots in planar materials as uh, two dimensional electron gas, uh, quantum dots in vertical nanostructures, and also quantum dots in uh, one dimensional channels such as in nanowires. And at QTEC, uh, one of the big efforts is uh, in making quantum dots, operating quantum dots as a spin qubit. But we have to remember that there are many ways we can operate quantum dots as spin qubits. And maybe the, best, the most well-known uh, way to use it is to operate, um, to encode the information in the spin degrees of freedom of an electron or a hole, which is trapped in these uh, potential landscapes. But another way is also to create, uh, use two dots to make the so-called singlet triplet qubits. And another way further is the, um, consists in the exchange only qubits. And this variety of quantum dots, um, actually like all these <coughs> different ways to make qubits provide with different pros and cons. Um, so for instance, for the three dots qubits, one can really say immediately, okay, but we, there is a large overhead to make overhead of quantum dots to make a single qubit. However, it comes with the benefit that to operate this exchange only qubits, I only need to control the exchange these two exchange interactions and without microwave control. So simply by applying uh, uh, square, square weights on these barriers, which are in between the two quantum dots. Um, in our division, we mainly focus on the Lotz de Vincenzo type spin qubits. And uh, probably you have seen a great implementation. Um, and so, so far, maybe the largest has been the linear six qubit arrays realized in, uh, on strain silicon. And uh, the two by two array relies on uh, germanium. And on these devices, universal control of the six and four qubits have been implemented. So one thing that you can obviously see when you look at these quantum dot images is that you really need a lot of control leads, such as these, um, such as these uh, gates or tunnel barriers, plunger gates, to basically control the interaction between the quantum dots, their energies of the confined charges, and actually also to measure the um, to measure the charges or the spin of this quantum dot. And we have to start asking the question ourselves on how this. Um, what is the consequence that this way of controlling quantum dots has in the long term? And also, how does this compare with other platforms? So for instance, now, if I look at maybe the most advanced uh, uh, qubit platform based on uh, superconducting qubits, 
So namely the 53 um, Strassmann qubit architecture of Google's, what you see typically is, um, what you see is that to operate about a chip with about 50 or 100 qubits, we really need to use a lot of control lines, which are connected inside the dilution refrigerators to the chip. So the chip, as you well know, is somewhere hidden, uh, somewhere hidden among these cables. And uh, for transmon devices, particularly for the device used in these um, uh, quantum supremacy experiment, for every qubit, they needed one line to excite the qubit, one line to con to change uh, its frequency, and one line to read out. So this is really going um, uh, linearly. So for every qubit you need to operate, you need to have uh, or two or three uh, lines. And these uh, masses of cables and dangling around really reminds us um, the one of the first implementation of actually the first program programmable computer realized in the, in the 45, 46 um, ENIAC, which was used to calculate, uh, which was designed to calculate uh, the artillery firing um, tables for the US uh, Army. And this classical computer was uh, in their first implementation, where as our quantum computer, uh, not really, not really reliable. Reliable. Uh, we know that whenever we maybe cool down the same device twice, we get some surprises. Either one gate doesn't work, or one fridge, but one of the fridge lines don't respond as we want. And this was because every connection here, about five million uh, connections, were hand soldiers manually to their lead. To, the, to each of their list. And, um, and because here the technology that was used was uh, basically the vacuum cube technology, which made the system as bulky as a room. So this is really one to one. Where are we now? And um, to go from uh, ENIAC to our smartphone, it took like several inventions, but maybe one of the, one of the most important was the invention of the integrated circuit after the transistor which really enabled to downscale everything in a more compact way. And now if we pose ourselves the question, what are the inventions that we really need to um, come up with to basically downscale our quantum computers? Um, and so we're basically here to discover and QTEC is here for this reason. Um, so to understand a bit what is uh, that we need, I want to basically borrow a concept from uh, classical electronics. I want to borrow the concept of rent rule. Rent was uh, an IBM um, engineer, which in 1960 observed this empirical trend between the number of pins, external pins of an integrated circuit, and the number of components, the number of transistors, essentially, in this one inside here. And what he observed is that this can, could be described by a polynomial uh, um, type, of, uh, type of equation, where the exponent p was in between zero and one. What we have to realize is that when P is equal one, for every transistor that you add into your circuit, you need to add a control line. And this really will make the system non-scalable. But what is the, the perfect example for a system with rent exponent one? It's actually our uh, few qubit experiment, where every control line in the chip has its unique functionality, it is then connected to its specific control lines, which is then wired to this individual uh, dark or pulse uh, source. And, um, and here we see basically a one-to-one -one co correlation between the number of control parameters with the number of uh, control uh, lines, let's say. And uh, clearly, if we want to make the system scalable, we want to try to implement some strategies to downscale this rent exponent from 1 to 0 0.5. And it has been a shared belief in the community that we have to go into this, some, this direction, where at least two inventions or two big developments need to happen. First is the integration of a classical electronic circuits inside the dilution refrigerator to basically remove or alleviate a huge number of uh, interconnections for the outside of the refrigerator. And second, we need to come up with a better strategy to control our, uh, our qubits based on quantum nodes. And um, as you know, today I'm going to focus on the lowest layer of the computing stack, where we implemented the first strategy based on a crossbar array, 
to really bring down the rent exponent on a quantum chip to from one to 0 0.5. And if you think in a really long term, this can make the controllability of um, a million qubits uh, more of a feasible task where we you only need about a thousand control lines. Um, so then this is probably what we need, right? And in fact, many in the community really believe that the integration of uh, classical electronics together with uh, registers of quantum dot qubits, which are controlled with a relatively low number of control lines, is maybe what we need to make the compact, uh, to make this uh, horrible uh, dilution refrigerator with many cables much more compact. So, but how can we achieve this? So we have to realize that to control a large number of quantum dots in the specific with a very small number of control lines, what we need is to be able to control the energy of 10 quantum dots with the same line. That means that we need to have a, a very large uniformity of the material. And so to try um, our experiment to, to take this step, we have decided to choose to pick um, germanium quantum wells, planar germanium quantum wells, which have a series of um, favorable properties for what we want to do. Um, so in particular, we are going to use, uh, we're going to define quantum dots in this high mobility channels, which is about 55 to 60 nanometer below the interface um, with uh, the dielectrics. And this large separation between basically our gate electrics provides with a relatively large, low charge noise, so a quiet environment for qubits. A second important aspect of germanium is that holes um, in germanium have a really low effective mass. That means that our confinement potential doesn't need to be too uh, severe. So we can allow the hole to live in a 100 by 100 nanometer um, circle or square rather than a 10 by 10 nanometer, uh, 10 by 10 um, square. Um, and this will really enable to make these devices in a more um, reproducible way in our academic clean. Another important aspect of uh, germanium is that we can make contacts to, the pl to this platform with metals and superconductors. And uh, in particular, recently it has been demonstrated a quantum well a bit more closer to the surface that is even possible to induce uh, our superconducting club in this high mobility channel. And very important is the ability that, um, given by the spin orbit coupling, uh, an interesting property of the germanium, to be able to perform all electric operations to basically drive the qubits using simple um, AC oscillations on the gates without the need of uh, um, extra micromagnets. But this is something that will also come back later. Then two very important properties is the ability to, in the, to maybe already now, to work with uh, isotopically purified germanium and also to be able to define um, states with no degenerate. So there is no uh, extra valley state such as in silicon. So with these uh, um, properties, then uh, um, we decided to realize this first crossbar architecture. And our device consists into this. Um, so what we have is um, a four by four grid of quantum dots where the quantum dots are defined under these circular plungers. And we read out the charge in this system, in this 16 quantum dots, by looking at the response of these uh, single hole transistors. And we can interrogate these single old transistors by looking at the current the flows or by looking at the RF reflections using a tank circuit. Now to understand a bit more, a bit better the chip, the, our circuit, what we have is we have two layers gates. Um, the first barrier gates con consist of these eight barrier gates that span the, basically the device from the bottom right to the top left. Then we have another uh, blue layer of barriers to span the device from the, in the opposite direction. And actually, the combination of these two barrier gates will provide with a lot of functionalities. And finally, we have uh, seven plunger gates, which can control the chemical potential of all these 16 quantum dots. If I look at the device on a vertical line cut of this device, what I see again is that what we're going to try to do is to create this uh, 
confinement potential where we can host uh, four um, holes on like uh, to drop holes onto these uh, wells uh, by engineering the voltages on these gates. And as you can see, every quantum dot is separated by the neighbor by two barriers. And in the grand term, this actually is an um, important step because it's gonna uh, because this architecture enables to downscale the rent exponent from one to 0.5, thanks to the um, aspect, thanks to um, using shared gates all across the device. Um, but then, how do we approach this system and how do we tune it? Uh, so we. I want to give you uh, a bit of an overview of what does it take to, to create a, a 16 quantum dot array. And this, I would really like to not use this method in the future. Let me put this clear. So I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna start by setting on some negative voltages on all gates based on the previous experience. So for instance, we are gonna set uh, minus 700 millivolt on the plungers and minus 300 millivolts on the barriers. Now what we do is we prepare the four charge sensors. So we are gonna basically tune these uh, single old transistors in the Coulomb regime where we can see nice Coulomb peaks. And then we are gonna sit at the flank of this Coulomb peak where um, the response of the sensors are really sensitive to the electro to changes in the electrostatic environment. What we then do is basically um, search for essentially um, features that resemble uh, textbooks, uh, just a bit diagrams. And how do we do it? We do, uh, we do it with uh, fast video mode scans that really enables us to navigate the, the device and they, they basically change in the gate voltages on the, on the array rather fast. Um, and often we find these uh, structures such as uh, this uh, nice just a bit diagram, but there are still, to get there, you know, you need to do many things. One of the things that you also need to implement is the, the creation of virtual gates, which enables you to scan rather the, than uh, an electric field, but the chemical potential of a real, uh, of a, a real quantum dot. Um, and then essentially you restart again until you achieve the full control of this. And this process, as you know, can take, uh, I think in our, in my experience, it, it took uh, about two or three weeks to set the entire device into a 16 quantum dot. Um, a procedure which I had to repeat two times. Um, but one uh, consequence of uh, our approach is that when we, we span uh, um, gates, for instance, P3 versus P2, multiple quantum dot transitions can be activated because when by scanning P3, I'm also changing the potential of this dot that we call Q3 bottom, this dot that we call Q3 middle, and also Q3 top. So in most of the cases, we're gonna see charge stability diagrams where multiple sets of parallel lines, of quasi-parallel lines can be seen. So here, for instance, indicated in uh, yellow, I see uh, this set of charge transition lines. And then in green, we have a clearly a different set of charge transition lines. And what we wanna try to do is to associate these different charge transition lines with a relative quantum node. So to do this, um, we make use of our grid architecture. In fact, if I am, um, if I want to understand whether this line belongs to dot three B, three N, or three T, I might just be able to basically step the gates around and see which lines move, and the lines will move both for essentially um, for the capacitor coupling of each line to each uh, quantum dot. So then we expect that the lines that belong to Q3 bottom will move with, uh, will strongly move with, with UB2, UB3, LB4, and LB3. And the, the red lines will be different for the dot Q3M. And again, the red pair lines will again be different for the dot on the top. And um, so what we have to do to really localize or recognize every quantum dot from charge stability diagram is to perform a very systematic analysis of the barrier lever arms. Um, and, 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 and that can really return a direct information on the quantum dot location. So for instance, if I step the voltage VVU1, 
what you see, so this is the barrier view, view one, view view one. You see that basically not much, not much happenings in this charge stability diagram. So maybe you can argue that you can recognize already that these lines move a bit, but we can see not too much. If I scan UV2 around this current voltage, you see that this line really starts to move to the, toward the left. While the other one, or for instance, this line remains rather still. If I scan then UV3, I really, which is really cutting inside the device, I see many more things uh, moving. And by analyzing this uh, data set, we can understand which one is which line. Now, um, so I think I've convinced you that now this line is probably this quantum node. What happens if I now move UB5? UB5 should couple to this quantum node and this one. And in fact, I see now that these lines move to the left, but also one P, one QT lines, the two lines coupled to P2 actually um, come down with respect to the other set of lines. I think here you see this line uh, moving, moving down with respect to the other. So now we do this, we do this analysis to extract how much these lines move, and we find out um, these kind of uh, histograms. So we have analyzed the three set of transition lines, which all depend on P3, so they are vertical in P3 with respect to when, when we take any P3 versus Px um, voltage, uh, plunger. And what we see is that we can get the first information that as I was showing before, that there are some lines which strongly respond to UB2 and 3, some lines that strongly respond with a voltage on 4 and 5, and some lines that strongly respond with 6 and 7. On the other end, the blue lines that return the more effective coupling are always the same. But this is something that actually we expect, because if I go back to our, uh, our structure, we know that these quantum laws are all, all lying in between LB3 and LB4. So we actually expect uh, exactly this, to have a um, similar coupling of LB3 and LB4 for all these Q3 quantum laws. Um, so to visualize better these results, what we do is we essentially pick uh, this amplitude and uh, color code it. And we basically fill this gate, our gate layout with the uh, amplitude uh, here. So what we can see already that by um, the, the results, these results suggest that this is the quantum dot under the analysis. And so forth by looking at where these high intense colors uh, cross, we can basically identify the quantum dot. In another way, we can see this even better. If we consider this as uh, probability distributions. And I want to um, take the step of considering basically the probability to be in between line one and two as uh, basically the integral in between, uh, the integral of a curve in between these lines, which is nothing else than the average. If I do this, then I know the probability to stay in between the red of every pair of red and blue lines. And, um, and uh, what you have is that, this is just to, to realize that if I know the probabilities to stay, let's say, in between here, and I know the probabilities to stay here, I know the probability of every side because the probability of these two independent uh, observables is just a product. So for every dot, for every side, I can obtain the probability of a dot in that position. And by doing this trick, I actually, we can re-visualize our quantum dots starting from the charge transition lines. And here you can really see the distribution of the probability, which is here on this pixel, which is a Q3 top in the four by four grid, Q3M and Q3 bottom. And now with this uh, uh, algorithm, essentially we can go back to the charge transition, uh, charge stability diagram and finally label these lines. And we have done this for many other gates by looking at these uh, charge transition lines, how they move. And, um, and uh, this is, for instance, for the three, for the three quantum dots under P5. As you can see, we see three bright spots, one here, one there, and one on the bottom. And we have actually do, um, showed that this was for all the 16 quantum dots in the grid. 
So now, um, a next step is to, if um, good to find a dot, but one thing that we really need to ask to our architecture is if it's good enough to confine an unpaired spin under each plunger. Um, and so we try this task and uh, at the end we even succeed. What we want to do is essentially try to turn the array into a spin qubit ready charge configuration. So in the ideal world, to if the, our quantum node platform is perfect, for the same voltages on every gate, we have, I don't know, for instance, the same occupation, but this clearly is not the case. The, our array has a finite size, so the, there is always some, there are always some edges effect, but also that there is some, uh, um, this maybe disorder, or maybe the gates are not industrially made gates, so these are not perfect. And so what we do now is we essentially try to tune all the quantum dots in the um, odd chart state. For instance, here we are trying to we, we tune the Q1 quantum dots in the first state. So we park our voltages here. Here we tune this voltage, this 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 dot into the first charge state, so we stay there. And these voltages are actually, we do this for 16 quantum nodes, and we find that it's actually possible to tune the entire array in an occupation which is either one hold or three holds. So here we have 11 quantum nodes at the first hold and five quantum nodes on the third hold. However, however, what we also see is that we have some, some accidental dots forming around our, uh, our architecture. Due to um, basically large uh, due to this on the fan out, which we cannot control now, but we know that in the future this may be prevented by adding additional uh, screening gates. Yeah, this was a full set of charge stability diagrams taken in the odd state. Um, okay, now let's look at the uniformity of this quantum dot array. So what we can do is actually consider the how big is essentially the valley of the first hole and the valley of the second hole, or the distance between consecutive Coulomb peaks. And we do this for all the 16 quantum dots. Um, this is basically the spacing in millivolt. Um, and what we find is that the spacing is on the order of 51 plus minus 6 millivolt for the first hole and 50 plus minus 9 millivolt for the second hole. So assuming uh, um, the same level arm for all the quantum dots, what it means is that the quantum dots are um, twins up to a 10 20 percent um, variation with respect to their own uh, total addition energy. Um, the next thing that we want to ask to our architecture is to provide with a tool to enable to uh, perform to individually address every point in this um, architecture, every exchange interaction of the architecture. So for instance, and this is something that the double barrier scheme actually allows for. So if I want to change the interaction between two, these two quantum dots, what I want to try is to operate only to turn on basically this gate, this red gate, and this blue gate. And this is in the long term may provide with a tool for uh, achieving a selective two qubit gates on the architecture. But what we do for now is simply look at how the tunnel coupling between the two quantum dots change as a function of the voltages applied on these two barriers. And what we see is that upon varying about 150 millivolt on this axis and 60 millivolt on this axis, we can turn on the coupling from approximately zero to around 20 gigahertz for this um, pair, vertical pair. And then we can do the same for an horizontal pair by simply changing which red gate we operate on. And we see that by using the same voltages ranges that we just used, um, the tunability of the tunnel coupling is comparable, where the maximum voltage is on the order of 13 gigahertz. And so now this may become um, a way to address basically the tunnel coupling in this crossbar arrays. But now uh, I want to take an extra step and think about a bit in the long term. So now imagine we have a perfect crossbar array where every quantum dot is filled with a single hole. We have achieved very good uniformity and we can control all the interactions. How can we actually drive the spin um, in this side? So nowadays in silicon for minimal arrays in silicon, people have introduced the uh, micromagnets on chip. 
This provides for a tool basically to um, achieve two things. One is to be able to selectively drive every qubit with a different uh, frequency. And the second one, this enables to convert uh, basically an oscillating electric field on the gate into a perceived uh, um, AC B field on the spin, which enables uh, spin rotations. In Germanium, this is done by the spin orbit coupling. So every gate uh, can rotate the qubit under it, define under it. Um, and the selectivity is actually given by different electric fields felt by the same quantum dot, by, by the different quantum dots. So if I have uh, two qubits and I, I can control with the same, uh, I can control them with the same line simply by using the two different frequencies of the qubits. However, if we think about in the long term and we are now asking to make qubits all the same, maybe that is not possible to engineer qubit frequency variation in the entire space. And it may be that it's actually quite hard to integrate micromanganese on top of these uh, crossbar architectures. So I've been talking a lot about the ability of um, operating on a point, on a crossbar array, by activating the, the corresponding column and row line. Can we actually use this scheme um, as a way to drive selectively in space the qubits? So we have been thinking about this scheme in which uh, to operate a qubit on a row i and a column j, we send basically two tones in, one on the column j and one on the row i, with uh, a condition that the sum of the two frequency of these tones provide uh, with essentially the next the, the right energy to the qubit. So in other way, in other ways, can we rotate this qubit in with two tones with the sum or the difference uh, that matches the qubit resonances? This would actually be nice because um, it, we we will enable to basically control the qubit rotation in space a bit more accurate than very accurate. Now we will be able to control. Uh, if we don't do this, we will have to simply try to create qubits different along each line. Um, and so what, this is the next page I want to turn on. Um, we tried this experiment on a two by two qubit arrays on um, realized in Germany. Um, we will mainly focus on the qubits on the top uh, controlled by line P1 and P2. So um, we will control these two qubits and we use also and what we observed in general is that we can control we can control the spin of these qubits by almost all the gates uh, surrounding uh, these two qubits. Um, and now this is the two spins energy spectrum. Um, the qubit one has a resonant frequency of about uh, 1.5 gigahertz. Qubit two has a resonant frequency of 2.6 gigahertz, and so. By giving a signal of with frequency 1.6, we can rotate Q1. And with a frequency 2.5, we can rotate Q2. Now, what I'm going to do, the experiment that I'm going to do is to essentially apply two tones at the same time with two different frequencies on the qubit, on these two qubit pairs, and scan these frequencies. So, eventually, what we obtain in the first instance is that we see exactly these two spectral lines, one at 2.5 years on both flanges. Here P1, here also P2 can, can tune this qubit. And here we see that at 1.6, one line here, and also one line here with an extra, extra things. And so this uh, map is taken is achieved at the center of the 1, 1, so in the so-called symmetry operation point. So if we now go away from this point, we actually introduce this uh, asymmetry in the system, which seems to enable for non-linear driving of the qubits. So for instance, if I look at this line here, which is rather faint, or this line, which is more visible, so there are lines in which the frequency of the excitation depends on both frequencies. So for the case of uh, this uh, line in green, in, uh, this corresponds to the case in which we drive qubit two with two tones, whose frequency are given by, whose two frequencies are given by these two, um, two, two plungers. And this line is essentially 
uh, associated with driving qubit one with a difference of a two tons. And here, qubit two with a difference of a two tons. We are still uh, exploring this, uh, um, this device, this uh, operation scheme. Um, but what we know so far is that for some of the points along this line, it's actually possible to achieve uh, coherent RB oscillations with two microwave bursts at the applied on this uh, on this case. So I think this one is uh, using we are driving Q2 with a difference of the two tones, and here we are driving um, Q2 with the sum of the two tones. And uh, with this, I would like to conclude. Um, so we have demonstrated uh, that shared control may be, an, uh, enable, may be enable to control uh, Q, uh, quantum dot resistors with a sublinear number of uh, control lines. Now we even demonstrated that these 16 quantum dots can be tuned into an odd uh, charge state regime. And this double barriers really has served a lot, at least in two cases, one to identify the quantum dots, but also one to achieve uh, and the addressable control of the interdot couplings. Moreover, we also introduced the, this EDSR control of the germanium qubits for um, the tuned, uh, <coughs> tuned quantum dot. And for the future, um, we require, uh, if you want to scale up a bit more, we really require, require schemes to automatically tune these devices. We also need to introduce, start thinking on how to introduce uh, charge sensors inside the array to build a, basically to build a, to build a functional, uh, functional uh, unit cell. And then we need to start working on uh, minimal uh, crossbar arrays uh, with co coordinate operations in minimal crossbar arrays. With this, I want to really thank all the people which have worked on uh, the specific work, but also all the other people in the, the other members of the MEM. Elders, Capuchin, the partner, Cyber Lab, to, for really supporting my adventure so far. Uh, thank you for uh, your attention. Hey, great. So, time for questions. I'm not sure how it works. I, I imagine you can just speak and then yeah, that would the mic will work. Uh, please do that. Yeah, um, the bichromatic uh, control. <clears throat> When you show the two rabbits, how important is that the two microwave bursts are in sync with each other or not? If does it have an influence? You hear beatings instead of the sum of the frequencies and stuff like that. So we haven't uh, actually had the time to <laughs> perform uh, to shift these two pulses in time, so we we don't know what will happen. However, we there are some beatings which are supposed to be predicted for different, uh, depending on the power on what is the strength of the signals, but we haven't seen them yet. Yeah, but certainly they need to be coherent, right? So they need to be in sync. Um, are there more questions? Or and, and online, I can't see you. So just mute yourself and shout out. Uh, and otherwise, uh, yeah, sorry, so again. Uh, yeah, so you show in the slide that you can tune all the charge occupation to odd numbers. Uh, do you have to rely on like hysteresis or some disorder to achieve this? I mean, mm -hmm. can you, yeah, if I just get another new device, you can, it's always uh, guaranteed that you can tune it to an odd uh, charge occupation or not. Yeah, I don't think so. So, uh, in, in short, we know that uh, in our semiconductor devices, like the the status of uh, the sample really depends on the history because indeed we often go into some accidental hysteresis. So we always run into some accidental hysteresis. So I believe that if you try to do the same experiment on a different device, you might not succeed. But if you um, but the results may change depending on how wide your voltages have been swept or, and in fact, this may be used as a tool to shift the transition lines where you want. But we didn't really investigate this systematically. We ended up here without really pushing hard or, yeah. Maybe to continue uh, a little bit that discussion. So do you have the slide with these sensors? And so in the meantime, um, so on, on the topic of, of disorder, uh, one question is actually where does the disorder come from, right? So you want to know that. And so if you look at the charge sensors, which is 
probably one of the first thing <laughs> to do before you start measuring the array. If you look at this, then then you would have said like no way uh, that it can be in the one 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 three one one and so forth, right? So so how can it be that this is such a distinct voltage for uh, all of them, and yet the dots are so good? Yeah. So the charge sensors, we we noticed that, that we definitely have to improve the, the design of the charge sensors because we know that we know and we we are not the only one that observe this that the charge sensors are heavily influenced by the voltages which are different on these fan out lines. So particularly by going a bit more down in voltage with this on this gate, my the wave function of the charge sensor moves a bit to the left. And therefore the tunnel coupling may be different so and so the amplitude of the column peaks. But also we have an extra gate here which has not been constant on all the sensors so that might also enable to push and pull the wave function away from the array. Yeah. But, but essentially I will I will say that you may have uh, variability in the response here, but because the gate layout is very uh, symmetric here and um, there is no large uh, fan out, you can still expect to have some order in there. Yeah, but I think it's it's one very important statement that, that to some extent, like what we've always been thinking as what is disorder is maybe actually due to the design, right? And, and I think one thing that you observed here is that, uh, you know, some variations are actually due to stray dots and, and omics and, and fan outs and so forth affecting the disorder, right? So that's more relevant as you scale up, of course. Well, because you have more gates. And more. Yeah, or but nuts, right? I mean, you could say, or the array is getting larger and then the inside is more homogeneous. Yeah. Yeah, right. Exactly. So even now we yeah. have a lot of edge effects because the, the design, the, the electric field in the center may be stronger than on the side, but. So more and more, you're probably in intrinsic disorder here. I think that's, that's very exciting. Sorry, you want to ask? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so could you, like, I'm not square really quantum dots, but you measure all of six, all of the 16 dots at the end at the same time? Because I imagine when you tune it, like, you one dot and all the other go the other way, right? So yes, you should be coupled that with some decoupling matrix of all the gates, or like at the end, did you just? How do you know all the 16s are in all those positions at the same time? Or is it like you tune one and then you tune another? Um, okay. How do I see that? Okay, so we have tuned the device in on two times. And the first time, our main goal was, okay, can we first, let's first tune every dot. Uh, let's first find every dot under the, each, each uh, of these case. And so as a consequence of this first approach, maybe we find this dot, this dot here, then we start looking here, and to define this dot here, we have to basically neglect these dots here. Maybe we have to apply a voltage on the barrier, which was not making this quantum dots very happy. And so this was a recursive method. But then we realized that on second tune up, it was more effective to also we know a bit more the device, right? So we, we bring all the voltages down, and then because we already know that the quantum dots will exist under every plunger. Um, they will just appear. And the question is, what is uh, the threshold? So is, uh, if I have a first wall here, so here we have a common plunger that controls four dots. If I have a one, dot, one hole here, can it at the same voltage have one hole here, one hole here, and one out there? This was the main challenge at the end. And yes, yeah, you look at all three sensors at the same time. Yeah. So. Um, we you have to exactly what we do is first find the configuration where all the quantum dots are for a one voltage for like a window main voltage is all the quantum dots are in the odd regime. Then we verify and demonstrate that these quantum dots are in the odd regime by essentially uh, depleting them. So this would be the magic points indicated by the square. And this is uh, this is now only showing the voltage on P1, but this is really on that day. With all the voltages of constants kept the same, all the quantum dot crossbar array is in the same in that charge equation. And then to demonstrate that this one is the first old, then we just deplete it and you see there is no extra transition lines here. <clears throat> Great, more questions. Yeah, in the back. You tried, or will you try uh, gate sensing perhaps to if that makes accessing the innermost dots that are farthest away from the charge sensors easier? Yeah, I mean, this is a question that comes often like, will it be a better use charge, um, charge sensing from the outside or 
dispersive readout. So one thing that I'm not convinced here about dispersive readout, but this might be not my opinion, <laughs> is that um, let me go. So in the dispersive readout, what you want to have to achieve a strong signal is to have a strong or high level arm to each dot now. So if I have this lead here, which my point. Okay, if I have this gate here, this gate is going to be distributed by across four dots. So as a consequence, every quantum dot can can go attribute can um, give maximum zero point twenty five. And so I believe that in the future, if this one will share 10 dots, the signal that I get for every dot is actually 0 0.1. So maybe it's not good enough for visibility. But this is my opinion. It may not work because of this. See, but, but continuing that question, and I think you've answered already to some extent, like the reason why, one of the reasons why you want to do dispersive for gate-based uh, readout is because people think that you cannot have sensors inside the array, right? They're bulky, you may have, uh, I, and that's also true here, right? So here from the edge, so if you scale, like, what do you do with the inner part? Um, but we're working on the spare time. <laughs> in the spare time, we're... And so in Germanium may be different, but maybe you can explain, like... Yes. In Germanium, we, what we're working actually on is to try to bring these sensors inside the, the array. But this poses some technological challenges. Because it's true that we can make omics with metals without uh, implement, implantations. But we nobody has demonstrated that you can make a hundred nanometer wide contact to the two deck here and still achieving good uh, yeah good contact to the two deck. So it's not impossible, but there needs to there needs to be some development there to make it happen. Great. <laughs> Are more questions? I see something in the chat, but that's maybe from the party. Uh... Yeah. Okay. So then I suggest to. Uh... Unmute yourself online and in the room and give Francesco another big applause.